recording. All right, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is uh, our last class on the Book of Mormon. We're going to try to get done with chapters 8, 9, and 10. Chapter 8 is fairly straightforward, so I'm not going to uh, go too deep into chapter 8. Um, give it the line by line um, uh, review like we've done in other chapters. But ultimately, so this is a chapter by an, another epistle of Mormon that Moroni stuck into the book. Um, this is at the beginning of his ministry, which is interesting. Um, my, let me read this. My beloved son Moroni, I, I rejoice exceedingly that your Lord Jesus Christ has been mindful of you and has called you to his ministry and his holy work. I am mindful of you always in my prayers, continually praying unto God the Father in the name of his holy child Jesus, that he through his infinite goodness and grace will keep you through the endurance of faith on his name to the end. Okay, so we have this. And then um, the topic that Mormon is um, interested in talking to Moroni about is infant baptism. So let's let's read that just for a second because I think that this is a, this is important. And now, my son, I speak unto you concerning that which grieveth me exceedingly, for it grieveth me that there should be disputations or arise among you. For if I for if I have learned the truth, there has been disputations among you concerning the baptism of your little children. And now, my son, I desire that you should labor diligently that this gross error should be removed from among you. For this intent, I have written the epistle. For immediately after I have learned these things of you, I inquired of the Lord concerning the matter. And the word of the Lord came unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost, saying, Listen to the words of Christ, your Redeemer. Your Lord and your God, behold, I came into the world not to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. The whole need no physician, but they that are sick. Wherefore, little children, little children are whole, for they are not capable of committing sin. Wherefore, the curse of Adam is taken from them in me, and that it hath no power over them. And the law of circumcision is done away in me, and after this manner did the Holy Ghost manifest the word of God unto me. So I find this interesting that this is specifically put in the Book of Mormon. Um, we know that if we relied exclusively on the New Testament or the Old Testament, we too would not, uh, this would be a doctrinal gray area um, uh, because it, it's not explicit or as explicit as this in the other books of scripture. So could you imagine the LDS faith or their, you know, any break off of the restoration tradition um, that uh, if they didn't have this chapter from Mormon uh, via Moroni, uh, this could be a, a point of doctrinal confusion or doctrinal d disputations. Um and, you know, you, you, so Mormon says it grieves his soul that this is a, a thing. You know, hell is paved by pure, pure intentions. Or how does that phrase go? Um, the road to hell is paved through, pure, through uh, good intentions. Isn't, isn't that the way it is? Yes. I, I am sure, thank you, I'm sure that uh, those who were disputing with each other weren't doing it in malice, uh, you know, uh, or spite or hate or maybe, but I, I doubt it. Um, they were probably doing it because of ignorance. So, you know, I'm really grateful that this piece of information is inserted at the end of the Book of Mormon because this could be a um, place of uh, contention or... Um, Ignorance, I guess you could say, if it wasn't in here. It, it seems to me that Mormon, Moroni is doing this in a few occasions in his book. He did it with baptism. He was very explicit on what to say in the baptism. Uh, he did it in the um, 
sacrament prayers. He was very explicit in what to say in the sacrament prayers. And uh, he's doing it again with infant baptism, um, adding his, his father's letter and being very explicit that you don't baptize children. Um, any thoughts on this before we continue on? This was a big issue, of course, for the Anabaptists and the early Protestant Reform, uh, reformers. Um, Royal Stassen suggested the fact that this is in here, uh, suggests that whoever was translating the Book of Mormon <clears throat> on the work of God um, was perhaps affected by those sorts of dis disputations which were popular in the 15th and 1600s. Um, so I always thought that was an interesting observation. Yeah. And well, and you think about it. So uh, Christ, when he comes to the Americas, the first thing that he does is become a little bit more, he become ex explicit on the doctrine of Christ. And he references that there were disputations about the doctrine of Christ. Um, and, you know, it, it, it it's nice that that isn't a, the test that we have isn't uh, um, that one where maybe the, the doctrine wasn't as explicit to them as it is to us. Um, so it is nice really having that. I think that the problem is, is we frequently just ignore the book altogether and, and don't care about baptism at all. So we all have our, our own tests. But we know that uh, Mormon makes this quite uh, explicit. And he goes in and he goes into uh, why it is um, children don't have repentance. They're not capable of sinning. Um, they're still in the Garden of Eden. When you're still in the Garden of Eden, um, you don't have the, 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 the understanding of good and evil um, like an adult or an older, an, a, you know, a young, a young adult who has the ability to, to tell right from wrong. So children, you know, it talks about, um, um, they teach parents that they must repent and be baptized and humble themselves as their little children. And they shall be saved with their little children and their little children need no repentance, neither baptism. Behold, baptism is unto repentance to the fulfilling of the commandments unto the remission of sins, but little children are alive in Christ from the foundation of the world. Um, children are still, as I said, children are still in the garden of Eden. Um, they haven't been, they haven't partaken of the fruit. Uh, so it, it makes no sense to baptize a child who has not partaken of the fruit. Uh, um, now, what I really like, if not so, God is a partial God and a changeable God and a respecter of persons. For how many children have died without baptism? Wherefore, if little children could not be saved without baptism, these must have gone to endless hell. And behold, I say unto you that he that supposeth that little children need baptism is in the gall of bitterness, in the bonds of iniquity, for he hath neither faith, hope, nor charity." So uh, God would be a partial God if that was a thing. And then you think about it. Let's think about this logically. If a child um, didn't have the capacity to know right from wrong and then is cut off without the law, without the, the ability to decide, then of course God is a partial God because the, the child has no agency. You cannot say a child has agency if the child is unable to accurately discern right from wrong. All right, um, any thoughts on this? I wanted to touch on this just a little bit, um, I, but uh, go on to chapter 9 and 10. Any, any thoughts before we continue on? It, it's my understanding that Pope Francis has just changed or at least modified or attenuated the Catholic teaching on the subject on limbo. And uh, he's effectively done away with limbo, which is where uh, children would go who are unbaptized. Does anybody know that, anything about that? 
I I don't know. I I don't really follow yeah. Catholicism. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, and and it's, this that's not only true of Catholicism, it's true of, you know, Greek Orthodox and and uh, Coptics too. Um limbo is where the souls of the unba- unbaptized infants go. But and that's been a big issue for a very long time, but Pope Francis has just changed that within the last few months. So that uh it's interesting that they're reconsidering that doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. Finally catching up with Marona, I guess. <laughs> well, I hope. Okay. Well, I'm going to go off to uh, Chapter 9. All right. So in Chapter 9, this, again, is an epistle from Mormon to his son, Moroni. Um, the second epistle of Mormon to Moroni. And um, God, it's interesting. It, the, the tone of this the tone of this uh, chapter is um, is unfortunate um, because uh, there's a lot of uh, bad stuff going on. So let's let's jump into it. I'm going to go halfway down the first paragraph. Well, I'll, I'll now um, I'll, I'll actually be reading most of this. And now behold, my son, I fear lest the Lamanite shall destroy this people, for they do not repent. And Satan stirreth them up continually to anger one with another. Behold, I am laboring with them continually. And when I speak the word of God with sharpness, they tremble and anger with me. And when I use no sharpness, they harden their hearts against it. Wherefore, I fear lest this <coughs> word, bless you, has ceased striving with them. For so exceedingly do they anger that it seemeth me that they have no fear of death and they have lost their love one towards another and they thirst after blood and revenge continually and now my beloved son notwithstanding their hardness let us labor diligently for if we should cease to labor we should be brought under condemnation for we have a labor to perform while in the tabernacle of clay that we may conquer the enemy of all righteousness and rest our souls in the kingdom of God. So the t- tone of this is really unfortunate. Um, Mormon is definitely lamenting, but there's a, there's some pieces of information in here that you actually hear throughout the book of Mormon where it says, and when we you no, is start the sentence before that. And when I speak the word of God with sharpness, they tremble in anger with me. And when I use no sharpness, they harden their hearts against it. So in the book of, um, God, I believe it's the book of Jerem, it says essentially the same thing. Um, but uh, Nephi, in the book, the, fir- the first book of Nephi uh, laments against this. It's really such a fascinating balancing act. And I've talked to a few people about it. You know, if you are stern and bold and speak with boldness, people get offended. If you don't use boldness, then people don't care. They don't listen to you. Um, Really, you know, what is the... um, What is the the balance um, between these two? Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Have you seen it in your life? Well, it used to happen as a missionary periodically. And, you know, you felt strongly to call people to repentance. I never seen it actually be very effective, however. I have too. And I, I've seen the effectiveness of, of uh, I mean, in both in both situations, being bold, I've seen um, people kind of you know get shaken and woken up, and I've seen uh, using a calm, pure, pure you know just simple language um, without boldness also be effective. The hypothetical that I see with this is, you know, we look at Nephi and his, his, uh, his interaction with Laman and Lemuel. 
Um, I have said this a couple times to different people at different times. And, and I may be wrong. And I am probably shaded by my own personal, um, my own personal uh, uh, personality and experiences. But uh, it almost seems to me like Nephi is dragging Laman and Lemuel on their heels saying, we're going to leave Jerusalem. We're not going back. We got to go this way. Um, but they keep on wanting to go back, almost like the wife of Lot when uh, they leave uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, that uh, they long to go back to their life before, but Nephi's, Nephi's continuing to go. Um, it seems to me that Lehi used, uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a balancing act where Lehi seemed to be the one who was uh, soft and um, they hardened their hearts um, against. And Nephi was the one who was sharp and they were offended. And if you look at the father and the son, they both, they both exhibited the, the two different characteristics of no sharpness and sharpness. And they both didn't listen to Lehi and they didn't listen. They called Lehi a visionary man. They complained against Lehi. Um, they asserted control over the ship on the way to the promised land without regard to Lehi. Um, and they also uh, used Nephi used sharpness and they were offended and tried to kill Nephi. Um, so I, I just don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. That, that's, a, I think, a very interesting observation on your part. Well done. Um, but let's, uh, let's uh, continue on. So, go. we have some lots of crap going on with the Nephites. Um, I don't really want to go into it, to be honest. Um, but you have uh, murder, rape, cannibalism. Um, Stuff that's really, really bad. I mean, this is like concentration camp, World War II type stuff. Um, but it's with the covenant people. Um, it's with it's with Israel. It's with a, a remnant of of Jacob. Um, so you know, you don't you you you, you, you call it. what? It's just fascinating. It, it, it seems to me that the higher you are elevated, the harder you fall. And this society received um, uh, a Zion for a couple generations, or at least the, the outlines and the fruit of a Zion for a few generations. And they were elevated very high. Um, they were blessed exceedingly. And then they turned their backs, rejected the truth, and they fell farther than 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 uh, most, which is really unfortunate. I don't really want to go into it, to be honest, because uh, that's about it. Um, uh, I do want to touch on one or two things in paragraph three, though. Um, I, where was it? Um, Starting with they. Where is they? All right. So they, they, they. Goodness, I can't find they. Um, carried away fruit, old men. Sorry, I'm trying to find pattern my notes versus inside the, the, um, Aaron. Where is Aaron? Am I looking at the wrong paragraph? Chapter nine, chapter nine. All right. Oh, the game. Yep, there it is. And as uh, and I actually want to. Uh, and as many as have fled unto the army of Aaron, they have fallen victims to their awful brutality. 
Oh, the depravity of my people. They are without order and without mercy. Behold, I am a man and I have but the strength of a man. I cannot any longer enforce my commands. And they have become strong in their perversion and they are alike brutal, sparing none, um, neither old nor young. And they delight in everything save it which is good. And the sufferings of our winning in it, women and our children upon the face of this land does, doth exceed exceedingly. Yea, the tongue cannot tell, neither can it be written. So, um, I think the one thing I wanted to highlight here, and what I underlined as I was going through this, is uh, they are without order and without mercy. What do you mean? What do you think it means by without order? Does that mean that there was a structure that they, you know, lined up for lunch, you know, one at a time and walked down the hall? I mean, what type of order are they talking about? Well, just a, a brief thought. Um, in World War II, as you look at the Soviet army invading Germany, the soldiers of the front line tended to be not too brutal, but the, um, the rear guard soldiers in, in the Soviet army as they came into Germany uh, were undisciplined. Uh, they didn't obey the rules of engagement or the rules of law, and they're the ones who committed the most atrocities on German citizens. So I think when, when you say they're without order, part of it is that they didn't obey the commandments, the, the commands of their leaders. And they turn into, you know, bands of pillagers rather than an organized army. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think so. Um, I think the problem is, is when you, we, in the Book of Mormon, it, it does actually communicate just war. Um, uh, and how to handle war, um, just war according to, and in one of the strong characters of the book of Mormon is Moroni, not, and the Moroni that this Moroni is named after, um, he defended his cities. He built up walls. He, he protected themselves. Um, I, uh, but when you turn into a organized gang, an organized uh, tyranny, um, you know, that's a big problem. That's a really big problem. All right. Um, okay, so this gets really sad. Um, Behold, my son, I cannot recommend them unto God, lest he should smite me. But behold, my son, I recommend thee unto God, and I trust in Christ that thou wilt be saved. And I pray unto God that he will spare thy life to witness the return of this people unto him or their utter destruction. For I know that they must perish except they repent and return unto him. Ho, oh, gall. So we live in a country that there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in the United States. There really, there really is. And the frequency and the level of that is only increasing. Um, we might be at the cliff. I still think that there's a little ways before the cliff for us. We're definitely approaching it, and we're approaching it at a rate that is alarming. Um, me, or Mormon is at the cliff, and he is seeing that his, uh, his uh, people, they're no longer Nineveh. They have rejected, in, in the, their case, they rejected, uh, they rejected um, the messengers. They, they have chosen to, uh, to willfully rebel. And he is seeing the end of his civilization, uh, the end of his people. 
Um, it must be very, very disappointing to Mormon. Uh, he just, uh, you know, we, if, we don't, we, I wish we had the time frame of these letters. Did Mormon already put together the Book of Mormon at this point? Um, or is this still yet in the future for Mormon? And he's writing these letters and his compilation of the Book of Mormon is still in the future. Um, I don't know, but I, I know that he had history. Um, he had the record since uh, he was uh, 10 or he had, was entrusted the record since he was 10. So he'd read the 2,500 uh, people at the, the Temple Bountiful um, that uh, witnessed Christ. He read about uh, Nephi and Lehi, and he read about the, his righteous ancestors. Now he's seeing the end of his civilization, and he recognizes that... Uh, uh, God is just and his people don't de no longer deserve grace, which is really sad. Um, any thoughts on that before we go on to chapter chapter 10? Okay. All right, the last chapter of the Book of Mormon. Um, Okay, so one of the biggest things, one of the greatest things that I have learned from this past, uh, the, the Sunday school lessons that we've gone, we, we started January, the first Sunday in January of 2018, and we are now finishing the Book of Mormon March 10th of 2019. So it's taken us uh, 14 and a half months. Um, we had some vacations. We didn't do it during uh, um, any conferences as well as uh, uh, we went slower in certain parts than we anticipated, uh, which is all good. But we're finishing it today. One of the things that I have learned the most is I've been very conscious about who is getting addressed in the chapters you kind of gloss over that, or at least I did growing up in the LDS tradition, is that, you know, the whole thing is meant for me, or this, these prophets are talking to me. Well, yes, but sometimes in, as a, like somebody is in a room, and somebody, say we're all in a room, and somebody, there's a message specifically to somebody but everybody else in the room benefits from that message. You raise your hand, you ask a question, the teacher talks to you directly to answer your question, but everybody else in the room benefits. That's how the Book of Mormon is. So let's read chapter 10. And chapter 10 is the missionary, the one that you don't, you're not a missionary if you don't know chapter 10 of the book of Moroni, because you read this over and over and over again. Now I, Moroni, this is now Moroni finishing up the record. Now I, Moroni, write somewhat as seemeth me good. And I write unto my brethren, the Lamanites. And I would that you should know that more than 420 years have passed away since the sign was sign was given of the coming of Christ. And I seal up these records after I've spoken a few words by way of exhortation to you. So is Moroni talking to and, and through okay, so this has happened, this happens throughout the entire Book of Mormon. It says, I'm talking to the Gentiles now. I'm talking to the Lamanites now. I'm talking to the house of Israel now. Chapter 10 is designed for the Lamanites. Now we all benefit. Um, we're all in the room, but Moroni is turning and talking directly to the Lamanites. He's turning the camera, doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with the camera, and he's talking directly to the Lamanites. Um, uh, he seals up the record. Um, the word seal kind of rings interesting to me. 
Um, was there an ordinance done to seal up the records? It was he just like, you know, sealing up, meaning, um, you know, he put the stamp on it and licked the letter and sealed the letter shut. Or was there some sort of blessing, some sort of seal um, placed on the record by Moroni? Is there is there something more to those words than what we first look at? And behold, I would exhort you that when ye shall receive these things, if it be wisdom in God that you should receive them. Again, who is he talking to? Is he talking to the Gentiles? Is he talking to the house of Israel? Or is this specifically talking to the Lamanites? And then the rest of us benefit. I think that the previous paragraph communicates who he is specifically talking to. And if it is wisdom in God that the Lamanites should have them, um, I, they would have them. That you re would remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam, even down until the time that you shall receive these things and ponder them in your hearts. Again, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Lamanites. He's talking to those who were here before Columbus. And I... I I shared this uh, maybe a, oh god maybe a week or two or th I, what what a, I think the last time I taught when Columbus arrived the estimates are that there were 60 million people in the Americas um, over the 1500s and the 1600s um, at the 200 years after Columbus you then have Cortez. You have the, the uh, Spain coming in and taking over essentially Mexico through South America, taking over the Aztecs, the Mayas, uh, the Incas. You then have the um, other Europeans, the um, uh, people from uh, England settling on the east coast of the United States. Um, you have smallpox coming in. And the estimates is that the population went from 60 million to 6 million in 200 years, primarily because of disease. So you have this, this civilization that survived um, uh, after the destruction of the Nephites and a whole bunch of splintering and people did different things. Now Mor Mormon ha Moroni has seen this. And he says, if it's wisdom in God for you guys, you guys, the Lamanites, to receive this, remember the Lord and his children all the way from creation. So we think of the, this land bridge that, um, you know, there's, for some reason, somebody was living in Siberia and walked across a land bridge 10,000 years ago and came down from Alaska, which doesn't make any sense. And historians are even communicating it now. If that was the case, the culture cores of the civilizations of the Americas would be on the West coast of the United States because that's where they would have come and they would have settled in California and in Washington and in Oregon. But that's not where the culture cores were. The culture cores were in uh, Maya. They were in the east coast of the United States. Uh, they were in other places. So you guys, you, did, you came just like us from Adam. God has been merciful to you, Lamanite. And if you receive these things, we, and when ye shall receive these things, I exhort you, Lamanite, that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true, and if you ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. And whatsoever is good is true, just and true. Wherefore, nothing that is good denieth the Christ, but acknowledgeth, acknowledgeth that he is. And he may know that he is by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, I would exhort you that you deny not the power of God, for he worketh by power according to the faith of the children and the men, of men, the same today, 
and tomorrow and forever. Okay. It's a pretty meaty paragraph right there. I love how it's a paragraph and not broken up into seven verses or how many it is. But it's all together. It's all connected. You Lamanites, this is for you. I would exhort you Lamanites that if it's in wisdom of, in God for uh, somebody to dig up this record from the rock that I'm going to put on it and you receive it and it's translated and it finds its way into your hand that you should know that you didn't walk across a land bridge, that you came by boat from Jerusalem through covenant parents, Lehi and Sariah, and that you are a part of the covenant of Lehi and Sariah. And this is your, this is your record. And if it's a record uh, from God and you ask in faith, the Holy Ghost will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you'll know that it's true because it will be good to you. It will be just. It'll exhibit, um, it will endow you with faith in Christ and power by the Holy Ghost. And by that endowment of faith, you will know that this is true. So this is essentially what Moroni is communicating. Now I'm going to continue on because the next thing that he says is very important because they're not in, in, in the LDS tradition growing up, call, this seemed like two different topics in chapter 10. Okay. I need, it's the end of the book. I have a, something to say. I have a, I have a few different things I need to say and I need to throw them all in. They don't really re relate, but let's just throw them all in. That's how I saw it growing up, but they're directly related. And again, I exhort you, my brethren, the Lamanites that ye deny not the gifts of God for they are many. And they come from the same God, and there are many ways that these gifts are administered. But it is the same God who worketh all in all, and they are given by the manifestations of the Spirit of God unto men to profit them. For behold, it is one to given by the Spirit of God that he may teach the word of wisdom, and to another that he may teach the word of knowledge by the same power, or teach by the same Spirit. And to another, exceeding great faith. And to another, the gifts of healings by the same spirit. And again, to another, that he may work mighty miracles. And again, to another, that he may prophesy concerning all things. And again, to another, beholding of angels and ministering spirits. And again, to another, all kinds of tongues. And again, to another, the interpretations of tongues of di uh, and diverse kinds of languages. And all these gifts come by the spirit of Christ. And they come unto men severally according as he wills. I would exhort you, my beloved brethren, the Lamanites, that ye remember that every good gift cometh of Christ. Okay, so what is the premise? In paragraph two, he says, okay, you'll know that this record is true because of the manifestations of the Spirit. Paragraph three. What are the manifestations of the Spirit? They are exceeding great faith, gifts of healing, manifestations of the Spirit, ministering of angels, ministering of the spirits. These are the, this is then what you would receive. Now, if you go back to what Mormon is saying in his book, if we do not have angels, if we do not have the interpretation of tongues, if we do not have healings, if we do not have these spiritual gifts or the leaderships of your churches don't have these or the people within your churches, you don't have these, then it is because of faith. Your faith is incomplete or is false or is based off of the wrong thing and you're not receiving these blessings. But if they, are, it is true then you would receive the gifts of the Spirit. They get connected. Now, I'm going to continue on because the, this continues to, to, to essentially reiterate what to expect. And I exhort you, my beloved brethren, the Lamanites, that you remember that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that all these gifts of which I have spoken are spiritual, never will be done away, 
even as long as the world shall stand. So if God, going back to uh, Nephi in his book, has God given his power unto man and finished his work? No, we, we have it right here. These gifts of the Spirit, the same ones that are in the New Testament, the same ones that Alma and Abinadi and Amulek and Mormon and Moroni and Nephi and Lehi, all of them are the same and they continue until the end of the world, until the world stands. Only according to the unbelief of the children of man. Okay. Never will be done away. Okay. Here's the premise. These spiritual gifts will never be done away only, but if they are, only according to the unbelief of the children of men. Now, unbelief, the definition of that is unbelief, lack of belief, or it is, is it wrong belief? Um, the definition, uh, I believe, and that is in uh, the teachings and commandments, and that is throughout the Book of Mormon, is when you find the word unbelief, it is not lack of belief. It is not atheism. It is false traditions. It's false notions, false belief. So if you don't have the spiritual gifts, if your revelation encompasses an, e an ecumenical council, whether that ecumenical council is in Nicaea or in the top room of the Salt Lake Temple, it's still wrong. It's an ecumenical council, um, and it is not based off of spiritual gifts. Only according to the unbelief of the children of men, wherefore there must be faith. And if there be faith, there also there must also be hope. And if there be hope, there must also be charity. For except ye have charity, ye can in no wise be saved in the kingdom of God. Neither can ye be saved in the kingdom of God if ye have not faith. Neither can ye if ye have no hope. And if you have no hope, you mean you ye must needs be in despair. And despair cometh because of iniquity. And Christ truly said unto our fathers, if ye have faith, ye cannot do these things which is ye cannot do all things which is expedient in me. So is receiving the Spirit connected and apart to receiving the gifts of the Spirit? which are they then connected and are in part of receiving hope and charity and faith. I would say that this is one thing. They're all connected. So could you then go back and say, um, I would exhort you that when you receive these things, if it be wisdom in God that you, receive, you should receive them, that you remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam, even down until the time you received these things and pondered in your hearts. And when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the eternal father, if these things are not true. And if you ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest it unto you by, let's insert some different words, by the manifestation of spiritual gifts and or by faith, hope, and charity, which are planted in your hearts by the power of the Holy Ghost. I mean, you could, you could go right here and add parentheses or brackets um, and say, uh, and he will manifest the truth of it unto you by br bracket the manifestations of the spirit, the, uh, the teaching the word of knowledge, teaching the word of wisdom, teaching, receiving the gifts of healing and the spirit, receiving mighty miracles, receiving angels, receiving tongues, receiving ministering spirits, receiving the interpretation of tongues, receiving faith, hope, and charity, unbracket, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, bracket, and then fill in the blanks with all those spiritual gifts and faith, hope, and charity. By the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. So if you receive any of those things and at the same time acknowledges that Christ is 
um, and denieth no unholy thing, is that then your witness? If you receive the gift of knowledge, is that a witness? If you receive the gift of wisdom, is that not your witness? If you receive charity, is that not your witness? Um, if you receive hope, is that not your witness? And with the qualification, it acknowledges Christ. Because if it denies Christ, then, then the adversary can imitate those. But the adversary cannot imitate uh, faith in Christ. Uh, no man serves two masters. He either hates the one and loves the other. The, the adversary won't do that. Um, all right, let's uh, uh, continue on. And now I speak unto all the ends of the earth. Okay, right here. We, uh, I've, I've pointed this out a few times throughout this book of scripture. We're in the room. The question or the, the comment was directed at the Lamanites. Now the rest of the room benefits for what was communicated directly to the remnant of Jacob or the remnant of Joseph. Um, now the, the, the teacher pivots and is talking to the entire room. And now I speak unto all the ends of the earth that if the day cometh that the power and gifts of God shall be done away among you, it shall be because of unbelief. So if we do not have bona fide revelation, if we have ecumenical councils either in Nicaea or Rome or in the third floor of the Salt Lake City, Tem uh, Salt Lake City Temple, and those spiritual gifts are gone, O oh, ye ends of the earth, it is because of false belief. And woe unto the children of men, if this be the case. For there shall be none that doeth good among you. No, not one. For if there be one among you that doeth good, he shall work by the power and gifts of God. Okay. I want to address this just for a second. Um, what good is Moroni talking about? Because there's definitely levels of good. Is Moroni saying, hey, no one's going to the soup kitchen. No one is mowing their neighbor's yard. No one is uh, donating to a hurricane relief cause. Is that what he's talking about? Is that the good that Moroni is talking about? Or is it the same type of good that Christ is talking about when Christ says, why do you call me good? There is only one good, and that is the Father. Is the good talking about what the Father's work is? Could you replace good with the Father's work? I want to I do that just for a second. And woe unto the children of men, if this be the case. For there shall be none that doeth the work of the Father among you, no, not one. For if there be one among you that doeth the work of the Father, replacing good, the word good with that, he shall work the, by the power and gifts of God. So can an atheist, can a Mormon, can a Baptist, can a Hindu, can a Buddhist, can a agnostic, can a Catholic do good in the sense of serving their neighbor? Um, mowing the lawn, taking food to the homeless, doing a bunch of good. Is that the good that Moroni is talking about? Or is the good doing the work of the father? Now, we talked uh, in the Book of Mormon, Mormon's book, in the Book of Mormon, uh, Moroni, or excuse me, Mormon uh, says in his last chapter that... Um, the angels work repentance and the covenants of the fathers. Could you then say, well, what is the work of the father? It is repentance and the work of the covenants. So let me repeat this one more. Let me review this one more time. Instead of inserting good, 
or inserting the work of the Father, I'm going to insert repentance and the covenants of the Father. And now I say unto you, all ye ends of the earth, that if the day cometh that the power and gifts of God shall be done away among you, it shall be because of false belief, replacing unbelief. And woe unto the children of men if this be the case, for there shall be none among you which work repentance and the covenants of the Father among you. No, not one. For if there be one among you that do doeth the repentance and the covenants of the fathers, he shall work by the power and gifts of God. So if you're doing the work of the covenants, you receive the gifts, the spiritual gifts of God. And woe unto them which shall do these things, or woe unto them which shall do these things away and die, for they die in their sins and they cannot be saved in the kingdom of God. I speak it according to the words of Christ. I lie not. I exhort you to remember these things. For the time speedily cometh that ye shall know that I lie not. For ye shall see me at the bar of God. And the Lord will say unto you, Did I not declare my words unto you, which were written by this man, like one crying from the dead? Crying from the dead. Should we uh, turn to these people? Uh, these fathers crying from the dead. Yea, even one as one speaking of the dust, I declare these things unto the fulfilling of the prophecies. For behold, they shall speak forth out of the mouth of the everlasting God, and his word shall his forth from generation to generation. And I, God, shall show unto you that that which I have written is true. Now I'm just going to finish this. Um. We are still under the brackets of, I speak unto all the ends of the earth. So we have moved past just speaking to Lamanites. We are still under Mor Moroni speaking to all the ends of the earth. So this paragraph is really important. Um, and I'm going to even insert the first top of uh, paragraph five. And now I speak unto you all the ends of the earth, comma. And again, I exhort you, all ye ends of the earth, that ye come unto Christ and lay hold on every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the unclean thing. All ye ends of the earth, awake and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, yea, and put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, and strengthen thy stakes and enlarge thy borders forever, that thou mayst no, mayest no more be confounded. That the covenants of the eternal father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, now we're at house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourself of all ungodliness. Yea, if you deny yourself of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind and strength. Then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace you may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God. Through the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that ye may become holy without spot. What are these beautiful garments? Is this just fanciful language? Is this just poetry that we should ignore? Or is there something about a beautiful garment that we must have at the wedding feast? And if we don't have this beautiful garment on, the master or the head of the wedding feast will cast us out. Um, why are, what are the daughters of Zion? O daughter of Zion, strengthen thy stinks and enlarge thy borders. Is this is, is Moroni just talking, is Moroni talking to the LDS church? Or was this book written before? I mean, it, it's funny. It is, what came first? This or the LDS church concept of stakes? It, 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 is, is the stake, what the LDS stake, the thing that should be strengthened and enlarged? Or is this a concept that, uh, when Moroni is quoting Isaiah here, this is something very different. Are we Zion? What is Zion? The pure in heart? Um, 
those who are equal, um, those who have one heart and one mind, should we put on this garment, this garment that represents priesthood? Should we put on this priesthood, this holy order um, that uh, is given to us if we accept it? Um, will that then strengthen ourselves, strengthen the stakes which we with which we stand on? Um, I, I, are, is this what he's talking about? Um, now, just to finish up, and I'll, I'll uh, open it up for questions. And now I bid unto you farewell. I soon go to the rest in the paradise of God until my spirit and body shall reunite shall again reunite, and I am brought before triumphant through the air to meet you before the pleasing bar of the great Jehovah, the eternal judge of both the quick and the dead. Um, Moroni being brought forth triumphantly through the air. This is a guy that watched his entire civilization die. I don't know if Moroni had a convert. Maybe he did. It, we, we don't know. We just know that his civilization died. Why is he triumphant? Is it because um, we may not have any success in our work, but if we do what we have been called to do, we are triumphant. That We may be a, a Moroni. We may be a ether who watches his civilization die in a cave. We may be um, an Abenadi who doesn't see the fruit of their labors, um, but, but uh, did what they were supposed to do regardless. Um, Moroni didn't see any of the fruit of his labors. He actually saw his civilization die, and he goes to the grave with only one thing. And that is the trust of Abraham that he, what he did, it will be beneficial to the children of men. He, he has this trust that someday this book is going to go to the Lamanites. And at some day, the Lamanites are going to accept the book and recognize that they are uh, a part of the remnant of Jacob, the remnant of Joseph who live here in the Americas. Uh, but he didn't see the fruit, but he still was triumphant. All right, um, I'd love to stop. We're, we're, uh, we are pushing up against our hour. Any thoughts before we finish? We appreciate your, your efforts over the last year and a half or so. Thank you, thank you. Um, so just for those that, um, that listen to this and you guys, um, we're, we're uh, Jeff is going to hop off. Um, he has some other commitments that he's going to, he has, um, I'm going to take a three week break, um, and start on April 6th and I'm going to do uh, the new Testament, um, the restoration edition of the new Testament, but I need to move the time to accommodate uh, family, uh, family requirement. So I'm going to move the time to 8 p.m. Mountain Time um, on Sunday evening. So if anybody is interested in joining at that time, I'll, I'll be doing the New Testament. Um, uh, I will be posting it on uh, the same YouTube channel. So if you want to listen to it afterward, but I, I've started the New Testament, um, uh, jumped ahead and Reading the Restoration Edition with the New Testament is so different. I've never read the New Testament the same. Um, the JSTs that were inserted, which is just as a uh, an update, or, I mean, an overview. That the, so the Restoration Edition of the New Testament, we have the entire JSTs plus any time in Joseph Smith's lectures which he did this frequently, he said he would read a passage and he said, if I were to um, translate this, this is what I would say. All of those are in there as well. So it is the most correct version of the New Testament according to 
the knowledge of the restoration. So we're going to begin that. Um, and uh, we'll start that on April 6th at 8 p.m. Mountain Time for anybody who's interested. Is that Mountain Standard or Mountain Daylight? And it is Mountain Daylight. So. Hey, uh, Bryce, I will, won't be able to attend at 8 p.m., but I will listen to your recordings. And I just wanted to thank you for the many insights and thorough uh, ponderings that you've shared with us. I've enjoyed it. Your lessons a lot okay so i will have to listen by recording and i will okay thanks sounds good sounds good well thanks everyone and thanks for joining us today this has been a lot of fun and and uh i've enjoyed it a lot okay Take care. all right thanks bye